Hello, I'm standing outside St Michael's Church in Bampton and uh, today we're going to go on a, a geological walk around the village and we're going to find out what's been happening here over the last four or five hundred million years and we're going to be getting the evidence from that by looking at the stones in the various buildings. And the church is a fantastic place to start. 600 million years ago, Devon was near the South Pole. Yes, the South Pole. It was on the northern edge of a huge landmass called Gondwana, a supercontinent made up of what we now know as Africa, South America, Antarctica and Australia. But it had begun to break up and Devon was part of a landmass called Avalonia which splintered off from Gondwana and started to move northwards, driven by plate tectonic forces. Bampton's geological story starts about 200 million years into that journey and Devon by now is into warmer tropical waters. So think of an environment a bit like um, the seas around Indonesia but with very different marine ecosystem. And that's what we're going to see right now inside St Michael's Church. Now I'm walking up towards the east end of the church just behind the altar and there's a couple of steps here and the uppermost step is a piece of 400 million year old Devon marble, possibly from Petit Tour. Now it started life as a, a slimy mud deposited on the floor of a warm sea. Rich it was in, in corals. Look, there's one here. You could see the scepter where the uh, coral polyps would have lived. Look at that. Oh, and just above it, there's something called a stromatolite, which was a kind of sponge-like organism with an algal mat on its surface. These would have reacted to the light coming through the water, and that's how they survived. And when they died, the structure remains in the rock. Over the next 100 million years or so, there was a great collision of continents, one from the north, one from the south, and the ocean disappeared. And the compression from both sides was so great that it forced this Devon limestone down deep into the crust. It went something like three kilometres down. And those sorts of depths, the temperature is both high and also the pressures are enormous. And it's ripped this rock apart. So it's full of lines and cracks and fissures where subsequently groundwater was able to penetrate under great pressure and leave behind deposits of calcium carbonate. Now, in the 17th and 18th century, Devon marble became very, very, very fashionable. There were 20 or so different types to choose from. But here in St Michael's Church, the people of, of the parish have clubbed together to afford this beautiful piece of marble to put in the very special part of the church. If you come to Bampton and you take a look at these walls, you'll see that they're made up of more than one type of rock. Now, the majority of the rocks here are hard sandstones, very fine-grained sandstone, kind of like the size of particle you would see, say, in caster sugar. Now, the sand that makes up this rock was carried here by huge rivers, draining a landmass to the north. There was a huge delta between South Wales and Northern Britain. And if you go to the Pennines today, you can actually look at rocks like the Millstone Grit. And these sediments were laid down in this delta. And the whole region was astride the equator. So the climate above this ocean was really quite warm and humid. But there's also limestone. Now, Bampton is famous for its limestone because it was valuable to burn as lime, which was spread on the fields to improve fertility. If you look round Bampton, there are several former uh, lime kilns. You can see them as you wander about. Now, this limestone was formed in a deep water limestone reef, not the shallow ones like the, uh, the Great Barrier Reef that you would see today around Australia. These were deep water reefs. And the material to make the limestone probably formed from the millions of dead bodies of plankton which rained down their, their tiny carbonate shells onto the seabed. In fact, all of these rocks that you can see in Bampton Church, they're all laid down in, in deep water. Now, one of the really interesting things to find here are evidence of sponges, sponges that lived on the seabed. 
so deep water sponges and the way to find them is to look for very hard black layers of stone between the limestone layers so let's see if we can find one well, as you can imagine, yes, there is. In fact, there's quite a lot in the wall here. In fact, I've got my hand lens, so if I get up really, really close, I can, I can see that it's almost, well, it's actually made of silica. Sponges had a, a body with a kind of silica scaffolding, should we call it, which allowed seawater to flow through it. So imagine you had a body where seawater could flow right the way through from one side to the other. It was a multicellular organism and the, the, I suppose a bit like a coral reef but with a body of silica rather than calcium carbonate. And um, this is how sponges obtain food and oxygen to, to survive. So not a very exciting life at the bottom of the sea. And anyway, once they died, their silica bodies were, were changed into these black blobs that you can see in the stone. The problem with the Bampton stone is that it generally doesn't cut terribly well. You have to work with the piece you've got. If you try to cut it, it will split and probably in a direction that, that you don't want. Uh, but these stones on the corner are very interesting because they can be cut in any direction. They're called a free stone. That's what a free stone is. Now, uh, if you get up close, in fact, you don't really need to get that close to be fair, uh, you'll see that they're absolutely crammed full of bubbles. And some of the bubbles particularly around the vestry door, have got material inside them. Now, what you're looking at here is a volcanic rock. Yes, a volcanic rock. So Devon had some volcanoes somewhere between three and 360 million years ago in this Carboniferous period. There were volcanoes. The area we now know as Devon was approximately on the equator, slowly moving north, as I say. And there was a landmass to the north and a large landmass to the south. And these landmasses were slowly crunching together to form a supercontinent. Between the two continents, there was a sea, and that's where Devon was. But later on, it became land. And um, there would be a range of mountains as high as the Rockies here. And into those mountains were intruded granites. Also in the churchyard, we have some Dartmoor granite, and therefore, if you had a bit more money, you'd be able to afford a granite tombstone. So let's see if we can find one. And yes, here we are. Here's some, uh, here's some granite. Now, uh, this is a gravestone for Reginald Hubert Edwards, and um, there are three stones here, and Claire Davis, his granddaughter, is also buried here and that's the freshest stone and if you get down on your knees have a close look at the surface you'll see there are three types of mineral in the granite the black mineral is biotite mica the white mineral is feldspar and the see-through mineral is quartz and if you have quartz and feldspar in a rock, in certain proportions, then it's a granite. And this is a beautiful piece. Now the process of, of this rock's formation started below the Earth's surface. What happened was that the continents collided. One of the uh, continental plates would have plunged down under the other, forced by simply the, the lateral pressure. If you want to have a go at this yourself, find... Um, a drying up cloth or something, put it on the table, put one hand to the left, one hand to the right, and then just slowly move them together. And the cloth will crinkle into all sorts of folds and contortions. And that's kind of what happened when the two continents collided, except these are rocks colliding. Once you get below about sort of 10 kilometers, the rocks start to flow a bit like stiff jelly but very, very hot and under enormous pressure. And if there's anywhere where that pressure is released, then that kind of stuff can find its way higher up into the crust. And once it's on its upward journey, then sometimes it's difficult to stop and then you end up with a volcano on the surface. So think the Andes, think the Rockies. And so this is what happened down here in Devon and Cornwall and northern France. Over a period of about 100 million years, 
and the Dartmoor granite is a surface expression of, of that because of course most of the mountains now have disappeared, they've been eroded away. But there's a record of that story right here in Bampton Churchyard. Now we're going to leave St Michael's Churchyard and uh, make our way down into the town. Just walking northwards down into Newton Square and uh, we're going to look for some more of the story of Bampton's long distant past. Now I'm standing outside uh, Corner Cottage, that's number nine Newton Square, and I'm looking at the wall between two light green doors and there are some beautiful examples of the chert. If we get up close, almost sponge-like in their shape as well. They're black, that's the key thing to look for. Right, well here we are, just moved down a little bit further down Newton Square. I'm looking at two absolutely beautiful stone pillars either side of this door. They're made of granite, the same granite that we saw in the churchyard. Uh, but the thing to notice here is that it's punctuated by these very large white crystals of feldspar. And these crystals formed very early on in the crystal mush uh, when the granite magma was much deeper down and they formed very, very, very slowly. So after these crystals formed, then the magma was injected much higher up in the crust where it's a little bit cooler and the um, crystals are smaller because they cooled more quickly and then finally the rock would have been solidified probably no more than I don't know 10 kilometers below the surface and of course it's now been exposed in Dartmoor by erosion and you can go and quarry it and of course it's been picked out this beautiful granite for a lot of purposes you see it everywhere but here in Bampton it's making up these very expensive looking uh, stone pillars so this was quite a wealthy person I think who who built this house well I've now moved further down into Brook Street and I'm standing outside number 29, Penny House. Now this used to be the post office, in fact there's still a pillar box outside. And the reason we've stopped here is because when it was converted from a post office to uh, a domestic dwelling, the owners brought in some beautiful stone, probably from Westley Quarry, which is just down the road, and rocks of the same age as the local rocks here in Bampton. Uh, but they're all fresh, so these are all, if you like, straight out of the quarry so you can get to see a lot of detail. Um, one of the things you'll be able to pick out is this beautiful blue limestone and the way it fractures. Quite a few of the stones here are veined. In fact, these are solid crystalline material, probably calcite. So when this mountain building episode occurred, there'll be an enormous amount of uh, poor fluid being squeezed out of rocks and this moves around within the rock column and sometimes under enormous pressure it's squeezed through cracks which are exploited vertical cracks horizontal cracks and that's what causes this veining there's one right in the middle of the house where you have a horizontal vein and you also have a vertical vein and the vertical one has been displaced slightly to the right so you can get a feel as to the order in which these veins were intruded into the rocks. This is the kind of work that geologists do trying to piece together the story, kind of rock detective work. Now if you go further down Brook Street I'm standing outside Costcutters and at knee level just to the left of the front door is a beautiful piece of stone and at the bottom of it you can see it's all layered. You can see one, two, three, four, five, maybe ten uh, layers of limestone with some sandstone in between and the ones at the bottom are all contorted uh, and this piece of rock tells quite an interesting piece of the story for us uh, and the different layers if you look at them you'll see some of them are limestone some of them are sandstone some of them are limestone some of them are sandstone there's a kind of alternation now with all this mountain building going on it's no surprise that there were earthquakes all the time and these earthquakes would occasionally disturb sediments piled up on the delta faces of uh, rivers to the north and it would disturb these sediments enough to cause a submarine landslide and then material would tumble down the continental slope billowing and churning as it went and grinding out shapes in the seabed underneath grooves and you can find those grooves in the in the rock and then slowly settling out uh, in slower time once the landslide was over 
And what you're seeing in some of the rocks in the walls here in Bampton is that story played out many times. So you could see the normal sedimentation, which would be clay uh, particles just settling out of the seawater and maybe um, plankton, their bodies made of calcium or silica, raining down on the seabed in slower time, forming a kind of gloop. Then periodically that peace and quiet will be disturbed by material coming from a uh, submarine landslide. For the next part of our geological story we're back here in St Michael's Church and I'm looking up at the east facing window and you'll see it's made up of a red coloured rock, uh, a rusty coloured rock. It's a very fine beautifully graded sandstone. It's actually a desert sandstone. It's quite difficult to get close to because it's about 10 feet up in the air. So you can't really get to, to touch it. But I can tell you it's desert sandstone and this dates from period, the Permian period, when, you remember I told you that the continents collided and they formed a supercontinent. Well, Britain was at the centre of this supercontinent, roughly about the latitude of the Sahara Desert. And yes, we had deserts uh, in this part of the world, and those red rocks you see when you're driving around Devon, those are most likely to be Permian uh, and Triassic sandstones. This was an environment actually that wasn't all dry. They had periodic huge rainstorms which used to wash vast amounts of material down into basins where it collected and then blew around in sand dunes and there's evidence of sand dunes here. In fact if you look at one of the rocks on the right hand side, one of those stones, you'll be able to see near horizontal lines. That's probably a sand dune but I can't get close up to confirm that. One of the ways you can confirm that these sands are blown by the wind is if you look very closely through a hand lens at the individual grains you'll see that they're rounded and polished by the wind. So now we're going to move away from the church to another part of the town for the next stage of our journey through deep time. Now I've come to a row of houses that used to be shops and the pale grey building stone used to convert them is what I've been looking for. It was chosen because it breaks naturally into regular blocks with flat faces and on those flat surfaces are lots and lots of fossil shells. You'll notice immediately that there are shells in the wall, lots of them, just like a small oyster. Look, they've got a, a very thick shell and that tells you they could cope with buffeting from the waves. So they lived in comparatively shallow water, just like oysters today. And that's the point. Understanding how oysters live today allows you to infer the ecological conditions that this fossil oyster enjoyed in the geological past. But remember, the oyster in the wall is an extinct species, so you can't be completely certain. Now, this one was one of the first oysters to evolve and seems to be able to cope better with the muddy water. Now, if you get up close, I, I can see marks on the shells. Oysters provided habitats for a host of other very small marine creatures, so these could be their remains or, or could be where the shell was attached to the substrate. I can't really tell, but I can see muscle scars where the two valves join together. And elsewhere, there's, uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's one over here with a tiny hole in the shell. Now, if the damage was, was caused while it was alive, uh, that could be a hole made by a crab looking for its dinner. And up over here, to the left, I think there are signs of what, well, I think they're worm burrows. And if that's right, this tells us that the gloopy, limey substrate was also alive with worms. But only their trails remain. Well, certainly shallow water, no ammonites here. They were around at this time, but they preferred deep water. And no dinosaurs either, they preferred land. Now there are geologists who have looked carefully at these rocks where they occur naturally, on the coast a few miles to the north of here. And there they found rare and exotic fossils, such as vertebrae of sea reptiles, shark's teeth, fish scales. But I'm afraid nothing like that here. I've had a good look.
So this was a period of time when the mountains created before had been largely eroded away and global sea level was relatively high and Devon was, was drowning in this shallow, warm tropical sea. The Tethys Ocean, as it was called, it ran east-west and it was full of life, which you can see for yourself in the walls of the buildings here in Bampton. And this is where we finish our journey through deep time. In the last 400 million years, Devon has been under the sea, exposed to volcanoes, scorched by the desert sun, hit by submarine landslides, squidged by mountains and intruded by hot granite magma. So the next time you're passing through Devon, why not drop into Bampton and experience the story for yourself? <laughs>